Um, so we are here with another Wild Maine program in partnership with the Center for Wildlife Studies. Um, I'll remind everybody on Zoom that you can type your questions into the chat and Q&A and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Jack Hopkins of the Center for Wildlife Studies. Thank you, Julia. And thank you all of you out there in the virtual world and those who've joined us here at the Camden Public Library for another um, edition of our Wild Maine program. Um, before I introduce our speaker for the night, I want to tell you a little bit about Center for Wildlife Studies. Here's my plug. Um, we're a Maine-based nonprofit, 501c3. Um, we're, we promote uh, wildlife conservation uh, through science and through um, environmental education. So we have research programs all over the world, as well as a network of scientists that train ecologists and conservation biologists, environmental scientists, and so on and so forth um, throughout the world. Um, we formed a partnership last year with the Camden Public Library to better educate the people here in Maine about our natural resources, um, also to, to educate our visitors who are here um, during different seasons. Um, and I want to put on your radar that we do have a few more programs this spring. So we have another program here the first week of April. They're, they're on Tuesdays. I believe it's April 2nd. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about wildlife tracking. I'm going to talk about tracks and scats. Um, something that's that's usually a pretty popular topic for folks um, who like to pass around photos of things that they capture in their backyard. Um, and, and then that will be followed up a few weeks later um, by a biologist from Inland Fisheries and Wildlife who will be talking about butterflies, the, the main butterflies. Okay. Um, the, the last thing I'd like to do is, is, is say that um, we appreciate your support. We appreciate you being here. We're also 501c3, so you uh, can go to centerforwildlifestudies.org and, and donate um, to this program in specific um, or to our other programs. I also want to thank our main sponsors, Whipfly and the Domarecki Foundation for supporting this program. Um, and with that said, I'd like to introduce Randy Cross. So I've known Randy since 2016 when I moved here to Maine. Um, Randy is a retired biologist with um, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, he grew up in Maine. He graduated from the University of Maine, Orono, with a degree in wildlife management. Um, he is also um, a very uh, experienced outdoorsman. Um, he is an expert canoeer. He's a Maine guide. Um, he is a hunter, and um, he has passed on a lot of these skills to his family, um, one of which his his son, who started a um, an outfit called Smoking Rivers here in Maine, uh, where they guide canoe trips, not only here in Maine, but um, elsewhere in the state. Uh, for years, Randy volunteered and also worked under contract when he was a when he was a young guy. Um, that was in the early '80s um, on the Bear Crew, and then he started leading in in '84. And so for 31 years, Randy worked and led the bear research and monitoring program here in the state of Maine. Um, he retired in 2019. He's still involved in efforts with the state, um, partly in the in the winter, but mostly in the spring during their major capture season. Um, he's also joining my team this year um, on the Penobscot Black Bear Study. So we're really excited to have him this year um, working with us. Um, he's He's been described by um, a lot of folks over the years because he's had such an impact on many students and um, lots of young budding field biologists. He's been described before as not only a really good guy and friend, but an excellent mentor. Um, and I'm really excited to have him today. So welcome, Randy. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. That was flattering. Um, um, is there a way I can see the next slide, like on the side here? Yes. Unless that was outstanding. As Jack yeah. said, I I work in the field efforts of this uh, black bear monitoring project uh, for for thirty eight years for both. Uh, both uh, trapping and then work going visiting dens. And um, uh, this is uh, 
this is Jack's slide here, which you probably wanted to have up there. Um, and uh, so I wanted to uh, say, I'll leave this up for a second because uh, the next slide's going to be up for a while. Uh, I wanted to uh, say that it's been four years at least, I think, since I've, I've done a, a presentation such as this. And so I do feel like I'm a little rusty. Um, the other thing is this presentation is uh, it's sort of dated, just like I am. It, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a few years old, but everything's still relevant, and I hope I'm still relevant too. Uh, I am to a certain degree. Um, so this uh, this study or monitoring program was uh, started in 1975 by uh, a guy named Roy Hugi, who was getting his um, doctorate um, studying bears in Maine. And uh, he developed the first two study areas in, um, in 1975, and that was the Spectacle Pond uh, study area about 20 miles west of Ashland, Maine. You can see it there, um, the northernmost one. And he, he started... Uh, uh, the Stacyville study area just west of Patton, Maine, towards the Mount Katahdin and uh, east branch of the Penobscot River. And that um, those two study areas were uh, in his uh, in his doctorate work was uh, to represent uh, an area of the the most intense hunting pressure, Stacyville next to Patton. Patton had really heavy hunting pressure on black bears at the time in 1975. And at that time, the Northern study area spec pond um, had very light hunting pressure. And uh, uh, so he's comparing the two populations under different hunting scenarios. Um, and the spec pond study area continues to today. Um, it's still active uh, with a number of collared female bears. Um, in 1980, the department uh, had uh, the commissioner closed the bear season before the end for the end of the bear season uh, would normally be because there was concern over possible over harvest. And at the time, our limited knowledge of how many bears we had in Maine uh, didn't feel comfortable harvesting over a thousand bears. Um, it's a very round figure and, and very somewhat arbitrary. At the time, we just didn't know enough about how many bears we had, how many bears were being born to replace bears being removed. So as a result of all the mayhem that comes from an emergency closure, which is very unusual, uh, closing a season, because guides have people booked for those, you know, to hunt those weeks. So, um, you know, the department had to get their act together when it came to bears. They had to learn, uh, learn more about bears and how many bears we could afford to harvest. So they, they ramped it up, uh, the, the program, and uh, uh, increased, you know, poured a bunch of money into it. And uh, started in 1982, a new study area just north, northwest of Old Town, um, in the Penobscot Lowlands called the Bradford Study Area. That study area is still active today um, with active uh, radio collared females. In 2004, we lost the last female off the air, flipped its collar in Stacyville. Uh, Stacyville, we had never trapped in Stacyville since uh, probably 1978, but at any rate, we didn't trap in the and because of technical failures and different things, you slowly lose bears over time. And the most during my career that we ever had in that study area was 12. It was down to one in 2003, and that one slipped its collar and just happened to be at the same time that we started the Down East study area to, uh, to address uh, an area of the state that we had uh, harvest information was telling us that we weren't representing with the other two primary 
study areas. So the other thing on this map I wanted to point out is back when this slide was made, they this is this is um, is really lame today, but they these different uh, hash marks and stuff were just uh, cut out uh, with scissors and put on on paper to create this map. Uh, it's kind of cool, but you know I remember those days. But you know it's not. Yeah. <laughs> So, and at that time, the white portion, which you're right in the middle of here, was considered unoccupied range. You can see that not true anymore. That was, uh, that, that slide was made uh, probably pretty close to 40 years ago, at least 35. And over that, the last four decades, bears have um, moved and pioneered into that country. So there are bears in this area. Not very many, very few actually. Um, probably, um, you know, you'd be unlikely to ever run into one, right? It's this area is still the least uh, uh, occupied density wise. So I could probably talk about this slide for quite a while, but I'm not going to. Downey study area, uh, that pink block over there is still active. It's pretty close to Bradford, as you can see, air miles very different situation in terms of food. So when when we ramped up the study, the whole point was uh, to now represent a certain portion of the bear population in Maine uh, living, uh, represent, uh, each study area represents a certain habitat type that these bears are living in. So if you have, uh, if you have uh, uh, down east, you have a very, uh, I would say a soft mass system as far as feed and in the spec pond study areas in the, in the big woods, there's soft mass there as well, but um, it's, uh, it's very different from down east. And the Penobscot lowlands is also very different. At least our bears are showing us that the, the menu is different. So this is uh it's been going on. This is the 50th year, which is quite unusual. Most states, you know, didn't uh, really get that interested in bears until later date. Um uh and and this slide is just trying to point out our primary objective uh of determining the recruitment rates of black bear under different habitat conditions, as I was trying to just describe a little bit. So you see a couple of cubs here with red ear tags. They're really hard to pick out these two here. Um, and um, this little one peeking out here. So counting cubs is part of what we do in the den work. Um, but it's um, it's basically, uh, if, you, if you can do a good job of estimating your recruitment, you can know how you're balancing against your harvest because we actually have the bear hunters register their bears. And so you, you know the number that's being taken out of the population. And if you compare that to a good estimate of your recruitment, you know if the population is going down or up. So I think that makes sense. Makes sense to me. They, uh, the, uh, every 10 years or so, we get a, a, a public working group together. Um, for all the big game species uh, to uh, talk about, uh, make goals and objectives, talk about do we want more moose, less moose. Over here, we have a problem with roadkill moose, uh, whatever. Um, or bears, you know, do we want more bears? Do we want bears here but not there? All of that. So um, that, um, so, Usually you have some people that want more bears and some people want less bears. Usually we're like, we get to the point where people say, well, we're, we're okay with the number of bears we have right now. Uh, they're not causing that much trouble. We can live with it. We're used to it. Uh, so let's keep them right where they are right now. And uh, so we're always trying to stabilize the population, it seems. And that was the goal in 1990 when we did the, uh, uh, this public working group. And at that time, we we, we felt that 
uh, between 1,500 and 2,500 bears was uh, about the right number to remove to uh, to uh, to accomplish that. Well, in 2000, it was time to do this new goal. And uh, here you see bar, bear harvest uh, during part of that period actually was in the uh, uh, desired uh, harvest range. Um, but in 2000, uh, right around, actually started in 1997, uh, our bears started becoming more successful at producing cubs. So we, uh, so it changes everything. And um, they started producing cubs at younger age. Um, all of that uh, is, uh, changes how many bears come into the population, which changes how many you need to take out if you're going to stabilize. So uh, the new harvest objective was between 3,500 and 4,000. And you can see that we met that for a few years and then fell below it there going out to 2010 at least. Um, so um, what's, what's causing all this variation? Um, the obvious thing you first think of is, uh, yeah, it must be how many hunters we have. And the green line here is the number of hunters, uh, I mean the harvest, sorry. And the red line is uh, the number of permits. And it does follow a little bit, uh, but the permits uh, don't explain always. Like you have places where the permit sales went up and the harvest went down and vice versa. Uh, like you, you know, so it, something else. Um, so what's driving the harvest? This right here shows the different types of harvest at during this period here. And it's mostly, uh, as you can see here, the red line represents the bears that are, are, are harvested over bait. And by far that is impacts the total harvest uh, more than anything else. Um, if you if you look at this shape, this M shape here in the middle, where it went up high and worked its way back down, and uh, you go back to this green line, which is the overall harvest, it's the same M shape, almost the exact same shape. The bait, the bears killed over bait, drives the total harvest because of just sheer proportion of it. Uh, I think there's a couple other things here that interest in the green line is the number of bears that are trapped by trappers, and that stays fairly low, though it's going up some now. The blue line is really interesting. That's the number of bears harvested by deer hunters during deer season, and you see it bouncing up and down that blue line. Um, and the reason for that is that back in the 90s and way back before that as well, um, I can vouch for at least another 15 years back. Um, every other year we had beech nuts and uh, every other year we didn't have beech nuts. When we didn't have beech nuts, the bears would go in their dens because it really was not enough good food to go out and keep trying to, to get fatter. They would lose ground. So they would go in their dens and so they'd be unavailable for the deer hunters every other year. And you can see when the beech nut crops started failing, when when this line went down, and it never has come back up much for deer hunters. Uh, we did have nuts last year, but you know, people that don't remember in the 80s, they have no idea how many more nuts we had back then. And uh, and bears would stay out now and beach. What I see for beech nuts, bears tend to eat all of them up pretty quick. Within a few weeks, they're mostly gone. Back in the old days, you go back when the beach were really the beach trees were really healthy, uh, bears would still be eating nuts the next spring when they came out of the den. There would be so many nuts left over. Um, and I would say last year that acorns were a bigger thing than um, than than beach nuts over a good part of the bear range. So I didn't mention the pink line. The pink line is uh, bears that are harvested using trained bear dogs. And um, you can see that doesn't look like it varies very much. But when I put the scale together um, to make 
to make it more comparable, it actually does follow uh, the same pattern or very similar, very closely to the bait harvest. So that's uh, one uh, bait is the yellow line and uh, hounds is the red line here. And um, it's remarkably, I, and that, that actually shocked me and surprised me. I didn't expect it because a bait harvest is usually higher on years when bears den early and the hound harvest, a lot of it comes after, the, most of it actually comes after the bait season. So anyway, not that interesting. Interesting to me, you know, as a bear manager, but um, it, it is curious. I'm trying to get, uh, kind of show you kind of what we, uh, how we're thinking when we're doing this uh, bear monitoring and how we're going to, uh, how we're going to manage the population. So, um, we have an, a very good inverse relationship between uh, natural foods when they're abundant, few bears are harvested, and when natural foods are low, uh, more bears are harvested. So you see opposite these two lines. The red line is, is showing uh, like average yielding weights for the next, the next gen season. Um, so when you, your yearlings weigh about 60 pounds, as they did here, uh, very few bears are uh, harvested. And so every peak in the yellow line is, is corresponding uh, valley in the red line, which is hard to follow, but I, I flipped the axis and you look at that and is you could never, or you couldn't uh, ever expect it to be more synchronized. Uh, and what this tells us is that our study areas, because this is a statewide harvest, our study areas are really uh, catching, capturing what's going on. Does that make sense to everyone? So we're not missing something because look, it's like when you got heavy yearlings, you don't, you, you know, and we're talking about 90, 95 dens, maybe uh, 95 females in three study areas in fairly small area. And that's doing the job to get this kind of obvious, obviously working. So, so how do you get your yearling weights? You have to go to the, to the dens and um, we have to go there to keep the females callers from running out of batteries. So we visit them every year. And um, this is a couple of the uh, hall of famers. Uh, these two guys both worked with me for seven years. Um, you kind of have to like snow if you're going to work these dens or you get used to it one or the other. These guys are, this is a, Happy crew, you can tell. Um, here we parked our sled here this day um, and um, went and visited a den, came back in about an hour and a half, and that's how much snow fell. It was it was snowing hard that day. This guy, this gal in the middle is Lisa Feener, uh, Lisa Bates at that time, but she married Jacob Feener, who grew up right here in Lincolnville. And um and they both worked for me for a long time. A lot of these pictures are taken by Lisa, and I'll mention her quite often. She was our, our den mole for a long time. Um, this guy here is Matt O'Neill. He's kind of running the, the den show right now. So when you go out to do your dens, you've got to find them. And this is how we find them. We have directional antenna. It's a real art to this, but... Um, the more you practice, the better you get. And that's how we actually find the, the, the caller sending a signal. And this antenna can tell which direction the caller is. So, so we'll talk about different types of dens. Uh, very common in our two southern study areas to have ground nests. About a third of the, of the dens are actually a big bird's nest on the ground. This is an empty, this uh, one on the right, lower right, is an empty nest uh, that was made mostly out of pine needles, I think, by looking at it. I, I want to stretch it like I would on my phone get a better look, but pretty sure that's what it is. And uh, we don't like seeing an empty nest like that. That bear just took off. Um, and that's what we found. Um, 
But in this other one, that's a ground nested bear. The bear's actually there. Uh, you see that little, uh, the bear's laying right there. And that's more common, very common that they're kind of often in a bit of a thicket, but, and they'll make their uh, nest out of uh, like fir boughs. And um, it just looks like a big bird's nest. And, uh, but they're, in our northern study area in Speck Pond, we very rarely see ground nests because the, the snow would get seven or eight feet deep some winters. Um, the last time I remember that was quite a while ago, I think 07, 08 winter. It was, it was literally, we were snowshoeing up there and the den was down there, often below, below the ground level or in real estate, they call it below grade, right? But, um, so when you got deep snow, these are two different dens, but the same guy, um, uh, a little, little uh, leprechaun it was my, my den mole for quite a while and did a great job. Um, so there are all kinds of cavities. The most common, uh, sometimes they'll actually excavate and dig a hole and go in, but that's fairly rare. Um, it could be a rock cavity. But the most common one is a tree that gets blown partially over and gets lodged in other trees and the roots pull up and they go right in under the roots there. So that's the most common cavity that we'll see bears in. One thing I wanna say, this guy's upside down, right? You see this guy, that's David Perk. And he's upside down and he's down there with a stick about this long, 24 inches long and uh, with a syringe on the end of it. And his face is about that far from the bear's face. And the bear is not very happy with the whole situation. It, there's nothing about it that doesn't appear to be dangerous, especially to the person that's upside down facing the bear. However, it really isn't dangerous. I've done over three, I've visited over 3,000 dents. Nobody has ever been contacted in a way that was injurious. People have been contacted, but not hurt. Out of all those dens, all those bears. So it is not dangerous, but it sure does feel like it at the time. And we really trust these bears have a no contact rule. They will slap so close to your nose, the side of the wall to tell you to back up. They know exactly where their claws are. And you think you ducked your head back like a turtle fast enough to be that it, that the bear missed you? The bear is not going to miss you if it wants to hit you. It's going to hit you, and they know what they're doing. And they'll blow right in your face, but they won't touch you. So that's pretty cool. A real dangerous thing is sharing icy log roads with large large trucks full of full of uh, logs and on, a, on an icy road, even if they have chains on, takes close to a mile for these trucks to stop. Um, and the other best chance for injuries is uh, riding the sleds. It always involves modes of transportation. <laughs> and we spend more time riding sleds than handling bears and riding snowshoes. I think this slide's sort of out of out of place, but uh, probably should have been up above there. But you know, we occasionally get tree dens, um, bears denning above the ground. Uh, we don't see it a lot in Maine. Uh, they're probably our most difficult den. And oh, I guess I guess why I put it here is because one of the most dangerous things we do is trying to handle bears in a tree, uh, especially some of the rotten trees, and you'll see in the video. Some of the trees is like pretty soft. Um, anyway, um, um, but I was going to say that tree dens are very common in flood prone areas and uh, especially in states south of like in Virginia and south of there. So of all the measurements, we take all kinds of measurements. We basically do a BMI for every bear. I don't know if you know what BMI is, body mass index, right? So we measure different lengths and girths and stuff and weigh them. But the weight itself is probably the one thing, if we could skip everything else in the weight, would give us so much information. 
especially on yearlings. It's the most sensitive measure of the previous food foraging season. Um, they tell you the, uh, the, the combination of all the foods that they eat, which is dozens of different foods. Um, John Muir once said that everything that's not granite produces food for grizzly bears. And it's really true, but I would argue that uh, it's also true for bears, black bears. I would argue that uh, granite does provide food for bears because if you watch bears at certain time of the year, especially if they're, they're anxious to wait for the raspberries to come out, they're going to start flipping rocks and they're eating invertebrates under those rocks. So granite does produce food for bears. So um, at any rate, the combination of all these foods put together, the yearlings who come toddling out of the den at five to eight pounds in the spring and around uh, first of April, first couple of weeks of April, they go from five to eight pounds to either something like 25 pounds, like the one I'm holding up. I don't know if you can tell that's me. That was a while ago. Um, um, that's 25 pounds. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure exactly, but I think so. I'm almost positive this one that you see in the upper right corner uh, is 96 pounds. But you you can see the average yearling weights back when I was showing you those those slides. They go from all the way down around 25 pounds to all the way up around 60. In fact, this year, uh, the den, uh, the yearlings average was 66 pounds, Matt, Matt told me. Um, he, he calculated out special for me in the middle of the den season so I could give you that tidbit. But that's a, that's a new record for us. An average of 66 pounds for one year old means it was the best food season in the 50 years that we've been studying year bears last season. Uh, certainly a good indication that we're not overpopulated with bears. Um, and so they're not stressed out with too much with starvation. However, speaking of starvation, a lot of cubs die through starvation. We sometimes use the term malnutrition, just a fancy way to say they starve to death. But if, if, a, if a cub gets so weak it can't keep up with the rest of the family, it's going to fall back. And the mother's just going to leave it. It's just she's just going to leave it. She's not going to carry it. And, and when they're small, uh, they're very vulnerable to predators. The mother's not there to protect them, so they may get preyed upon. But what caused the death of that bear? What caused the death death of that cub was not enough milk. And the mother can only produce so much milk depending on how big she is and how fit she is. So um, you can see two different sized bears here. These are these, uh, the big ones, the sister, and the little ones, the brother. Um, the better chance of the big one, which is about five and a half pounds, living when the, the, the little boy was uh, two pounds, four ounces, I believe. Um, so it's the two pound, four ounce bear cub that was clearly starving even in March when we were there. That's just a two month old cub, but it should average weight at that time of year should be about five pounds. Um, but now I'm going to start talking about how does a two pound cub become a 412 pound bear? And this is a 12 year old bear from Northern Maine. Um, stupid name, but we called him St Super Dave. Um, he was. Um, uh, it had probably the widest head I ever saw on a bear of all the bears I've, I've handled. But uh, he was a little muddy in this den, but I kind of like it. He kind of looks good. <laughs> He's 12 years old. Did I say that? How much did he weigh? 412. And that's uh, spring, breeding season, bottom of the white swing. We weigh about 200 pounds more mm -hmm. in the fall. Uh, so, like we talked about, a little bit about food, but habitat really is just food for bears. That's all their job is every day. Go out and get the best food, the most calories, the least amount of calories spent. So they, and they're very good at it. It's their whole life. That's what they do. And so um, they eat 80% vegetation, vegetative origin um, uh, in Maine and most states when, you know, uh, many states, but they do, uh, 
they do uh, sometimes uh, right when calves, most calves are being born or fawns are being dropped. Uh, they do prey upon them. Uh, they really don't prey on too many animals. Like they might, uh, you know, stumble. No, I shouldn't say stumble. Just happen onto a, a ground nest of a of a grouse or something and and eat the eggs or something. But it's not. They don't really actively uh, hunt much in Maine. Um, but there were two studies in very similar habitat. In fact, one was in New Brunswick that indicated uh, clearly that black bears were about even with coyotes in terms of their impact on, on fawns, deer fawns. And that's a deer fawn uh, captured by a game trail camera. It's one of our pink tag bears, which tells me it's down east, but I could tell you it's down east just by the color of the face of that bear. So um, the next thing is our, our, our uh, we're doing okay right now. Time we'll cruise into the end here. I can move a little faster if I need to. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the next field season, which is um, is a trapping in the spring. And if we don't trap in the spring, the same thing that happened to Stacyville will happen to all of our study areas. We need to support. We're always losing bears. Bears are. Callers are quitting because we couldn't catch them in the winter den, and the, and the battery runs out. There's all kinds of ways to lose them, so you have to you have to go out and trap every year to keep your numbers up. Um, and so this is a bear named Diesel from down east. Um, bear's a lot taller than he looks there. He weighed 366, which is real common. Diesel engine. I'm told I'm not a motorhead. <laughs> 366 Cummins diesel engine. Anybody? I don't. See, I, I I know that only because one of my guys is a real motorhead. But that's why we named him Diesel. And um, he weighed 366, and he gained, now I can't remember, but I think he weighed 510 when he was shot about three months later. So to give you an idea, they gained a lot of weight. And uh, I've actually caught a bear uh, that gained close to four pounds a day, a big, a big frame bear like this, close to four pounds a day right after breeding season was over. We're catching them during breeding season in the spring and they're at their kind of lowest, lowest weight. So the first thing for trapping is to pre-bait. That's another picture of uh, Lisa Fina lugging bait in the snow. And then we, uh, we set these traps. Um, this one here, um, this way we want the bear to step right there between these two sticks and, you know, you have brush over here and over there and, and you have, you put a donut hole here and a donut hole there and a line of donut holes or whatever we're using for bait. Now we mostly use trail mix, but, uh, regardless, uh, if you're lucky, bear does step there and you capture the bear. So, um, this bear we call tank it was the first time he was caught first time bears are caught they're not very happy with the whole situation um they're not sure how it's all going to turn out this bear is a scrapper you can tell from the marks on his face uh he's a short bear which means he doesn't weigh as much as a lot of other bears had to fight his whole life he's um he's not um yeah not, i don't know how to describe all what i'm, I'm getting at all these bears are different from each other and based a lot on their kind of social hierarchy, how much confidence they have in themselves and stuff. And this bear is staring me directly in the eye. I'm over here approaching him with a with a six foot jab pole at the time. And um and uh Lisa's taking the picture. <laughs> he looks at Lisa and then he looks at me and he decides I'm the guy to keep an eye on. So he looks directly in my eye, in my eyes, very intimidating, not looking over here, over here, looking right here. And all of a sudden I feel a little shorter and that six foot stick looks real short now. And uh, the biggest thing that bothers me, and, and I remember it real well, cause I gotta be cool. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years, no big deal. This is 2009 uh, and uh, I like that. That steel cable looks awful small. <laughs> looks awful thin. 
but uh, everything works out. Um, you know, it 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 just uh, you got to suck it up. But it is very intimidating. You know, the body language. This bear is doesn't think I'm there to play cards. He's he's ready to take me on if that's what I need. What he needs to do. So this is um, probably an old picture, 1993. This is uh, a young male. We would call this kind of think of this as sort of a teenager. These are the hardest bears to to uh, get the drug in uh, when you when you've um, when you've captured it because it's about a 250 pound bear, and uh, they're just very athletic. Uh, they're very strong, very athletic, and very have a, a good endurance and and uh, and they see how he's gunned that tree. That tree's not going to make it. And uh, and you can see the edge of the circle really clear. That's why I keep this. You can really see the edge of how far he can reach. And you can see this is Ted Iglehart from Kentucky. You can see his feet are not going to step in here and where the bear can reach him. But um, these bears don't know whether they're going to, they want to charge or they want to run away from you. And they do both a lot of times, make it very difficult. But uh, regardless, I wanted to point out the circle, and uh, that's as far as they can reach. The problem is you get a really big bear, and this is a really big bear, one of the biggest bears I ever did. Uh, I weighed 432 late in the breeding season. Um, and these really big bears tend not to show you how far they can reach. They tend not to make a circle, and, and I don't know how much they tug on it, but you don't know how far they can reach. And um, so the good thing about these really big bears is that they're so confident and so um, dignified. They're too dignified to stand up. You know, in this case, look at this bear is like, you don't scare me. Just cross that line. Now, this is, uh, I find, I, I really like this slide because this is John Wood. He's for a local boy too. And uh, he's a little nervous. He's asking me right then, this, can this bear reach me? And I remember telling him, it's got to go around the tree first. You, it doesn't look like it there, but his head's on my side of the tree. I'm, I'm opposite John. Who's Anyway, the bear's looking at the people taking pictures. So he's keeping his eye. It was, it was switch day, so we had both crews there. He's keeping his eye on that group of photographers he's keeping his ear on me because see that ear i'm right over here just off the frame i'm actually closer than john is and he's keeping this ear which is really interesting on john so he knows if john gets closer to him he knows if i get closer because neither one of us is in his periphery he's looking at the group of, of people all taking pictures and videos and whatnot he never even got up uh he he, he he, he's just about to get the drug. The drug's right there. The syringe is right there. He he looked around the tree like that at John, like, yeah, you better not do that again type thing. But he didn't even get up. And and so as scary as it is, and, and I'm telling you, John, uh, John is ready to go put it in reverse. I can I can tell you. He does, he's not really sure if that bear can reach him. I, and I told him I don't I don't know, but I know I'm closer than you are to him. So um, we measure everything when we capture a bear. We measure everything when we when we we go to the dens. But we often catch bears that aren't tagged. That particular bear we had caught in that same exact site uh, for the year the bear I was just showing you four years earlier. And so the first capture is very different from the second capture of the same bear. Of course, four years later the bear is way bigger and feels a lot better about himself. So it's a little different that way. Um, but regardless, um, what I'm, uh, what we're doing here is pulling a really small vestigial, it's called a premolar, and that will allow you to uh, get an age. And so we do that on all the, all the bears that are older than yearling and to be sure how old they are for our research. And um, when you take a thin section of that tooth after it's decalcified. I used to do this in Bangor as part of my job um, to process these teeth and age them. You get, um, you can tell how old they are. Each one of these dark lines is a winter that this that this bear went through. I took this from a, uh, 
from a postcard. Actually, I took the picture. This is a long time ago, but and I think I had the secretary scan it or something. But somehow this came off a postcard, and I don't know um, for a company in, in Montana that does this commercially for states and. Uh, I don't know what state this bear is from, but I can tell you this, this bear is not growing very fast. Um, the first winter over here, second, third, fourth, I don't know if you can see the area, fifth, sixth, seventh, and didn't, I can tell it's a female because you can see these parallel tracks down here. I keep pointing here and you can't see where I'm pointing. Um, you see these parallel winters close together, winters close together. That's uh the first litter, she had the first litter at eight years old, which is really old. In Maine, I've only seen one bear ever go that long before giving birth to cubs. And most of our, our females in Maine give birth at four or five, mostly four, actually. So wherever this bear was, it wasn't getting all that good of food, um, and it wasn't growing very fast to make the threshold weight to produce cubs, and she produced one litter here at eight years old, another litter at 10, which is pretty common, another litter at 12. And that one's even harder to see the double line. I can see it, but anyway, I'm not sure if it it, it got uh, run over or I don't know what happened to it, but it got harvested probably. But um, uh, I'm not absolutely sure if she did have that uh, fourth litter, but I think she did. So. That was what I was supposed to show. My wife was doing this at midnight, Sunday night, after a power came on. My wife's sitting back in the corner. And I would never be able to do this. This is pretty cool. But I forgot about this next, this one here. But um, anyway, I forgot it. Now, now I'm stuck. I, when I'm talking about cubs, I should have had it. So um, anyway, we, we, we made it. I think the time's not too bad. And... Um, um i have one more that's we won't take complaints but we'll take questions complaints maybe later i don't know um uh, yeah that's it i like questions so i don't know if our first thing i, I don't know yeah, we have some time for questions and before we get to the video yeah I'd like to know if bears are impacted by the ticks the way we hear the other way. About. You know what's interesting? Ticks, a great question. Um, we actually have a place on our field sheet for marking down the abundance of ticks on the bears. And for most of my career, I thought, this is stupid. You know, it came up from Pennsylvania, right? Because uh, George Matula, when he started the study, he had worked with Gary Alt in Pennsylvania, and they have a lot of ticks down there on their bears. So uh, we just adopted basically their field sheet. So, so many years, it never saw a tick. Once, once in a while, a tick would say, oh, yeah, there's a tick. So abundance would be rare. Uh, starting about probably, I'm thinking now about 10 years ago, we started seeing ticks more and more on the bears, wood ticks, mostly dog ticks, and uh, not winter ticks like on the moose that are really causing trouble. With. The, they're, the winter ticks on the moose are just pretty much uh, with moose for a host. They don't they don't affect other animals. It's just moose winter ticks. They're they're dog ticks or some people call them wood ticks. But the most common tick out there that gets on everything. It, it obviously gets on dogs, but gets on rabbits and you know all kinds of things. The deer ticks are uh, smaller and. Well, I'm, I shouldn't talk about it. I'm not even a tick expert. Not very many ticks on bears in general, uh, but we are seeing more in, 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 in the more recent years. And uh, how much it takes away, I don't know. They, it doesn't seem to bother them too bad. It's nothing like what the ticks are, winter ticks are doing to moose. It's a good question. I, I got to be careful. I don't get on to topics I don't really know much about. Um, yeah. When did the electronic monitoring collars start being used in Maine? What year? Well, I believe. Are any of those bears still active? Are you still? No, uh, but I believe uh, that when Roy Hugie was uh, collaring bears, that was the first animals collared in the state in 1975. Those collars were still 
they were pretty well developed at that time, but they were still evolving, you know. And the callers that are used now, uh, they mostly use satellite callers now. They're callers that send signal to the satellite, uh, GPS callers, and and you can go on your computer and say, okay, that's where the bear was at this date and this time, and three or five times a day or whatever, you know, you program it, you know, it will show you all the, you know, it's kind of cool, but it's it just higher tech, you know, and, but I'll tell you what, higher tech, you lose a lot more bears. You got to trap more because the higher, the old regular VHF and all it did is send a signal beep, beep, beep. Those didn't fail near as much as the fancier ones. So. So how old can these bears live? And what's the biggest case study you had on bear in the program? On a particular bear, 30. Boy, I'm not sure. I'm going to tell you you wouldn't know the difference, right? Uh, I think uh, <laughs> this, this bear in Spec Pond we had on the air since she was a cub. I handled her as a cub. And 32 years later, she was still on the air. But that's, they're getting pretty old. They they produce cubs up to about 23 to 25, maybe even 26. But right, that's about when they're done producing cubs. And from that point on, often their health starts to go down pretty fast. The teeth start going, or they might have trouble with their joints, like arthritis and stuff. And their eyes will start, you can tell they're getting cloudy and harder to see. So, over a long period of time, have you seen the bear population increase, decrease, or stabilize? And if it's decreased, why would that be the fault? Not suppose you know. <laughs> it may have it may have decreased in in some small areas, but uh, no no place that I know. Uh, in general, it's just very slowly increased during my time. Um, the most, in, you know, the three study areas I'm most familiar with and spent most of the time in um, the Bradford study area, just northwest of Old Town, it clearly increased the most, and uh, no doubt in my mind. When I first trapped there, uh, I actually have a slide here somewhere I could show you, but it doesn't matter. When I first trapped there um, to get six callers out in a year, in an in a eight-month trap season, eight week trap season was we figured that was pretty good um but back when i started we trapped 30 weeks trapped all summer into fall but um in towards the end of it we were putting 24 callers out in six weeks uh, and and that's a pretty undeniable increase in numbers and you know i've seen that i've seen that over basically 40 years uh, this trap season would be my 42nd year that have trapped bears for the department. So uh, that's a pretty long period of time. Uh, and most, I've only been in down East Maine since 2004. I would say every indicator that we have shows a slow increase in statewide population. Why, how would that be? How, how, what do you attribute that to? With more traffic, more this, more that, more everything. Yeah, Again, well, not. Oh. Yeah, not really more harvest. The uh, uh, the harvest has kind of stabilized around three thousand. It's not quite enough, especially if you could see all the numbers that we come up with for increased productivity. That's the big thing. When um, as the beech trees started to fail, there was a great deal of concern that our bears what would they eat, and at that time. There was a lot of timber harvesting going on, and the whole the whole thing shaked out. Um, not that we would actually anticipate it. We actually, I, I'll tell you what, we actually anticipated things getting worse, uh, but they got better. Yeah, and so I can tell you in the northern Maine study area, which represents the most bears in Maine. Their diet is more varied now than it was. They have uh, much better vegetation greens in the spring. They still kind of live on the roads. That's where the best greens are. Um, and uh, such because it's just where they are. 
but uh, also back in the clear cuts, um, there's like uh, wild lettuce and such like that, that before the cuts, they didn't have access to as much. Back when I started it in the early 80s, there was this big uh, area called Chase Brook Swamp. Uh, we called it. It was dark growth, uh, black growth, uh, spruce fir, cedar, a lot of cedar. Um, and there was a bear that lived there, and she traveled like about 18 miles just to eat raspberries in August because she had no raspberries in her home range. She had to go somewhere to get them. Um, and about 1990, somewhere right about there, they cut most of that. And 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 a few years later, it's a great big raspberry field. But <laughs> it's just you know, but it things change. But the food situation is better based on how fast they're growing, how many cubs they're producing, how many cubs live. So we count the cubs. That's just the start. 1995, we had tons of cubs. A lot of cubs were born. Almost all of them died. That was a drought year. Uh, very bad times for bears in Maine. Even uh, older bears starved to death that summer. Um, actually, they don't starve to death until the following April, May, but uh, still. Um, yeah, normally about, I meant to say this before, normally about 70% of the cubs survive uh, on, on average, 60 to 75. Um, but on a really bad year, it can go down below 30% survival. Almost everybody dies. And, um, you know, if they make it to the den, they might not make it to the next June 1st uh, when they come out of the den. So it's it's uh, hard to see. It's hard. I had to deal with it. Um, but it's just it's just nature is what happens. Uh, there's nothing we can do about it. And I'm there to record what happens. And I'm I'm there to show this is what this is what our productivity was this year. So we don't count bears recruitment. We don't count cubs as entering the population, we count yearlings, because once the yearlings uh, leave their mother, they're an uh, independent individual as part of the population. That's where we, that's where we talk about recruitment. That's, that's what we're talking about. So, go ahead. Call tags from other places like Canada or New Hampshire? Not much from Canada. New Hampshire quite a bit because most of their bears that they're, they're tagging nuisance bears, and then uh, New Hampshire's a small state. I talked about this earlier. The, you know, most of their nuisance problems in, in the southern half of the state, but where they're going to go, they, you know, they only get in trouble taking it to some other state. So they take it right to the northeast corner of New Hampshire, let it go. Second jump, it's either in Quebec or it's in Maine. So uh, it might go straight home, but some of those nuisance bears hang a left and end up going down the Androscoggin uh, River drainage and and could end up anywhere. And somebody was telling about one of them was right here in Camden, or close by, I don't know that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, you know, what they're looking for is the, the land of milk and honey where every house has a bird feeder to still have yeah. birds. And it's just like, this is like, Manna from heaven. It's just like you can YouTube video of that there if anybody yeah. wants to take a fun today. The rankings there. <laughs> there was another question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Stay back because some of the kids, the, the cubs die. But you ever save a cub? Like that one that you could tell one will survive and one won't? Would you ever keep it? And Boy, you really want to all the time, but I would. I and sometimes I'll tell you with the yearlings. Um, if if you do a yearling, I did a yearling that weighed nine pounds, twelve ounces. That's a year old bear. I've done cubs that weigh the same amount and that's two months old. This is a bag of bones. I know that bear's going to die, but that was a male, so we didn't we didn't, we gave him a chance. We put the ear tags in. You never know. But most of the time, when yearlings are under twenty pounds in the den. They're not going to make it to June 1st. But if you assume they're all going to die, they don't always. So you put a collar on a on a 15-pound female yearling, and you're like, I'm going to be picking that up in the end of May. That's going to be gone, mortality signal. And son of a gun, she's in the den next year. She made it, you know. 
So you you got to give them the chance, and we we have to we have to stay out of it. We do uh, we do we have always done it. Uh, it, it try to take care of orphans. Like a uh, mother gets killed in the road, and the cubs are running around. We catch them, try to raise them, get them back in 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 the wild. But that's a different thing. The study, unfortunately, much as you want to give them a cheeseburger or your you know whatever sandwich you have to fit. You want to give them that stuff, but you, you you really can't. You're supposed to not interfere. Just let everything happen as it happens, and then try to record it. And um, yeah, you know, you know. sometimes the orphans, when we put them back out, we we'll put collars on them, and we don't worry because they're, they're never used for our um, for our, our statistics. Uh, we don't worry about helping them, and we actually do sometimes put care packages in their den so that because they're you know maybe they live maybe they don't but the whole we're trying to give them a second chance and so it's not really regular research bear at that point so. probably move on yeah so we have time for questions